Hello, and welcome to the Rules of Voice Leading, with a focus on resolving dominant sevenths. With me, your host, Dr. David Bashwerner, Associate Professor of Music at the University of New Mexico. Introduction, counterpoint, the art of coordinating melody and harmony. The idea of the triad or chord, as we saw in a previous video, did not exist formally before the 17th century. When composers wrote music, they focused predominantly on adding one melodic line to another. You can call this horizontal thinking. Horizontal would mean melodic. While composers were not thinking in chords, however, they were definitely careful to coordinate these superimposed melodies with one another in terms of the intervals formed between voices. You can call this vertical thinking. Vertical meaning intervallic, harmonic, or chordal. By definition, counterpoint combines melodic and harmonic thinking. More specifically, counterpoint is a kind of ideal in which horizontal and vertical considerations are equal. So let's look more in-depth at this contrapuntal ideal, um, melody and harmony being equal. To achieve this contrapuntal ideal, neither harmony nor melody can be ignored. They must be like two sides of a single coin. In writing harmony, one must be simultaneously thinking melodically. In writing melody, one must be simultaneously thinking harmonically. What does it mean to think melodically when writing harmony, and what does it mean to think harmonically when writing melodically? Well, that is the main question addressed in this presentation. And for a little hint, the answer likely has something to do with the title of the presentation, which is The Rules of Voice Leading. So, um, in this slide, we will look at a counterexample, a case in which melody is dominant to harmony, by which I mean more important, not dominant in the sense of dominant and tonic. So before we dig into the rules of ideal voice leading, we are going to consider a counter example. Most styles of music do not strike an ideal balance between melodic and harmonic structure. And we can take this example from Mozart. From Rondo in C, which is also in our textbook on page 171. As we know, Mozart was a classical composer. Counterpoint was a dominant force in music composition from the later medieval era through the Renaissance and to the end of the Baroque. Baroque, you can think of as ending in about 16, uh, sorry, 1750. Uh, and this is because Bach, J.S. Bach, dies in 1750 and his sons at this, uh, at around that time, are becoming popular. So as he is dying, he is the end of the Baroque, and his sons are sort of the beginning of the classical era. That's why the, the year 1750 is a good one for the division between the Baroque and the classical era, and Mozart is born in 1756. So, uh, and of course, Mozart is composing from a very young age. So by the time he's eight, uh, he, he's somewhat of a famous composer. Um, so Mozart is, is fairly at the beginning of the classical era, although you can say it begins as early as maybe 1725. But once the classical era begins, counterpoint is thrown out the window, and composers begin writing in the melody and accompaniment style. So I, um, I may have taken a bit of a cul-de-sac there, but counterpoint was the dominant force in music composition from the later medieval era through the Renaissance into the end of the Baroque in 1750, but as the classical era begins, at the end of the Baroque, around 1750, counterpoint is no longer a major force, and composers begin to write in the melody and accompaniment style. And that is what we have here, and I will just go ahead and play one more time. Melody and accompaniment. Mozart, interestingly enough, discovers the works of J.S. Bach only at the end of his life. I believe he was 28 or something at the time, uh, maybe 22, but he gets pretty excited about it and he starts writing a little bit differently. But before that, he really just isn't thinking all that much about counterpoint. In this example, you could certainly say that melody is dominant to harmony. The left hand 
is always simply playing either a one chord, C, E, G, C, E, G, C, E, G, right, over and over, or a five card, G, D, G, G, D, G, and there's no B in the left hand, but you can imagine that it's there. Uh, in the left hand, there's no melody. It's really just arpeggiating these triads. So you would say Mozart is thinking melodically in the right hand, where he's not really thinking melodically in the left hand, just um, about chords and arpeggios of chords. But we are going to look a little bit more closely. If we do look closer, we see that Mozart is not only thinking, is not thinking only harmonically in the left hand. And this, I believe we can hear it one more time. Um, why don't you pay attention to what's going on in the left hand this time? If we think of the left hand as having three voices, we see that they follow certain rules. The top line, uh, which we could call the alto, stays in the same note, which is G, G4. You notice that with, you know, the left hand normally in bass clef, this is actually in treble clef. Um, so except for the very last bar, the alto is just staying on that G. Bum, bum, bum. The middle line, which we can call the tenor, is, going be, is moving as little as possible between E and D. And then the lowest voice is going C, G, C, G, and then C. So the bottom line, which we can call the bass, alternates between the roots of the chords, C4, G3, and then ending at the very end on C3. Now, whoops, that arrow's not supposed to be crossing out that thing. Oh, that's supposed to be a little bit higher. But um, So guideline one, common tones and steps. Retain common tones, moving up our voices mostly by step. We are going to see later in this presentation that this is one of the guidelines that Lates recommends. Um, those arrows are supposed to be pointing at the upper two lines, the top line, the alto, stays on the same note. So that um, alto voice is moving as little as possible. It's not even moving any notes at all. It's always staying on the G. So it's retaining a common tone. The middle line, the tenor, is moving as little as possible between the notes E and D. It's just moving stepwise. And then it's the bass that's kind of jumping around a bit. So just keep this in the back of the mind. Uh, at the end, we'll see where the guideline one comes in, but this is an example of this. The right hand melody I have here, I added it in this little reduction. You can see at the beginning of this bar. I've reduced that to G and then C, G, E, and then G, E, C, D, B, G. So what the right hand is doing is very chordal as well. It's just playing a note of the C chord, all three notes of the C chord, all three notes of the C chord, all three notes of the G chord, a note of the C chord, all three notes, blah, blah, blah. Um, so even the melody is pretty harmonic. Um, ooh, sorry, it's overlapping. The melody plays exclusively chord tones, except for two neighbor tones and two grace notes and i believe we get to see those here in the melody that's the grace note c b c since c is a chord tone c e g c c b c so that b is a neighbor tone it's a non-chord tone and what is it it moves away from the c and then back again and um, oh, sorry, there's another one again here. D, C, D, D is a chord tone. G, D, G. D, C, D. So the C is a non chord tone, and what kind? It's a neighbor tone. Okay, so, and this is just a little review. Note the phrase structure in this example and the cadence types. So Leitz has marked the phrases. This first phrase ends on a five chord, which is a half cadence. Two, one. So the soprano ends two, one. It moves stepwise to tonic, and the harmony goes five chord going to one chord. So that is a, an authentic cadence because it's 5-1, and we can say what kind of ascending cadence. Both chords are in root position, and the soprano is moving to scale degree 1 by step, so therefore it's a perfect authentic cadence. Why don't we listen one more time? Yeah. 
you remember this tune, um, Periton, Viderunt Omnes. If you don't remember it, you should probably go back and watch the video called The Evolution of the Triad. Um, let's give it a listen. <laughs> Um, so we're not going to be paying attention to everything. This is just a recap of a slide from previous time. These eight, five sonorities are what, uh, Periton is always sort of like having his little tiny cadences onto, um, all these subphrases. Uh, there's only one kind of a triad and that's not really a triad, but what you see is, are these voice leading patterns. <laughs> Four, five, four, five, four, five. So you see seven, one, four, five, and mm, do, 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 two, one. So you get two, one, seven, one, and then four, five. And that's something that we're going to see in Periton, but in, in other composers as well. Uh, go ahead and listen one more time. and cadence, blah, 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 top voice, ti, do, lowest voice, re, do, middle voice, fa, so, this produces an eight, five sonority on the last beat, do, so, do, and a first inversion diminished triad on the previous beat, re, fa, ti, note that this full pattern doesn't really occur in this piece, but the individual voices are always are often behaving in these ways. And then we're just going to see that. So this is in 1198. By the time we get about 100 years later, composers really are doing this three voice pattern pretty often. So I want to remind you of this guideline. Um, common tones of steps retain common tones, moving upper voices mostly by step. Is Periton doing this? Yeah, he's got Tito. Fa, so, re, do. So all three individual voices are moving by step. So it's almost like, I mean, this is true, but <laughs> it's also almost like this. Um, Periton knows he wants to end on F, C, F. And so he, he knows if he wants to end F here, he says, ah, well, I could go um, from stepwise from below. That's how I get the T, do. I, I can go stepwise from above. That's how I get re, do. And then when I want to go to C, I can go... Fa, sol, or I could go la, sol, and he actually does that too, but I ignored it because it's not super common later on. But he's doing all those things. So he's really moving stepwise to the tones he wants to end on. Guideline eight. I'm going to introduce you to another one. This is this is guideline straight from the Lates book, and I numbered them according to Lates. That's why they have these numbers. Um, and over the course of the presentation, we learn about all the guidelines and rules that he gives us. Um, guideline eight, outer voice contrary motion. Move outer voices in contrary motion as much as possible. These are just guidelines, not rules. Does Periton do this? The top voice is going, ti, do. The bottom voice is going, re, do, so, ti, re, ti, do, do. Yeah, so this one's going up, that one's going down. So they are moving in contrary motion. Good job, Periton. Rule number one, Leitz is going to teach us about this. Tendency tones, you have to resolve them. Resolve tendency tones. What are the tendency tones? Well, we are going to look at that, but let me just tell you, scale degree 7, the leading tone, is a tendency tone. It should resolve up to the tonic. Scale degree 4 in this chord does not have to resolve down, so, and it actually doesn't. In the dominant chord, it will, dominant 7th chord. But neither of these other ones are tendency tones. They could resolve in either direction. Uh, and then in terms of doubling, rule 3 tendency tones should not be doubled. Let's just see. There's three voices here. One voice is on the E. That's our that's our one tendency tone. Has Periton doubled it? Nope. No one else is doing an E. Everyone has their own note, actually. There's no doublings here at all. Oh, here there is a doubling 
um, the top voice and the bottom voice are both on Fs. So that's called a doubling, um, but that's fine. You, he just should not be doubling scale degree 7. And, you know, Periton doesn't have these rules yet, but he's already doing this. So it makes you think, you know, if people are doing this from the very beginning when they're writing um, multi-part music, it just makes you think, oh, maybe these rules are not completely arbitrary. Maybe Periton kind of discovered these things and successive generations of composers kept rediscovering these things and that's how we honed the particular rules that we have for counterpoint. Guillaume de Macho. <laughs> So at the end there, you heard, um, I think that's what it was. Um, I believe I have another sound file here. So the bass is going B flat, A, B flat, D. G, A, B flat, A, G, A. So that's your 7, 1. Note that this is not a semitone. That's a whole step. This is the semitone. So this is a different kind of cadence. It's called the Phrygian cadence. Um, but it's still the same general principle. You can see the voice leading still works the same. 7, 1 in the top voice, 2, 1 in the bottom voice, 4, 5 in the middle voice. So I'm we're calling this the Macho cadence just because Macho is the composer here. Top voice goes 7, 1. Lowest voice goes 2, 1. Middle voice goes 4-5. This produces an 8-5 sonority on the last beat. And a first inversion triad on the previous beat. And this just happens because it's a Phrygian cadence and the key we're in, stuff like that. This happens to be a G minor chord in first inversion. In the previous page, it was an E diminished. So it's just a triad in first inversion that goes to this 8-5 sonority. In Machaud time, Machaud's time, this full pattern does frequently occur. So the last piece we were looking at was from 1198 with Periton. This is a little bit over 100 years later, maybe 150 years, and Machaud is definitely doing this cadence pattern kind of all over the place. So let's just check the rules and guidelines. Rule number one, tendency tones. Is he resolving his tendency tones? Here, the seven going to one is not really a tendency tone. That's not the leading tone. We could actually say that the flat two going to one is tendency tone. For now, um, we just kind of ignore that one. Um, tendency tones is, is, he shouldn't be doubling them. We don't really have any tendency tones here, so we don't have to pay attention. But we could just say, hey, are there any doublings at all? In this chord, there's no doublings. A G, a B flat, and a D. In this chord, there is a doubling, A, E, A. The A is doubled, A is not a tendency tone, so we're fine. Guideline number one, common tones and steps, is my show retaining common tones or moving stepwise. Yes, each of these voices moves stepwise. This voice moves a whole step, this voice half step, this one moves a whole step. So yes, he's doing that, he's following that guideline. Even though that guideline didn't exist for him, it's like he's discovering the guideline. And then, you know, Periton discovered it a little bit, Machot discovered it a little bit more. Maybe he learned a little something from Periton, maybe he just figured it out himself. But you know, over hundreds of years of people keep discovering these things, they, they become, more, you know, written down in books as rules. And now we have them as rules and we kind of say like, why do we have these rules? Well, composers seem to have been discovering these things again and again. Um, guideline eight, outer voice contrary motion. Um, Leitz is gonna advise us to move outer voices in contrary motion as much as possible. Is Guillaume de Macho doing this? G, A, going up, B flat, A, going down. So yes, he is actually doing that. Interesting. Thank you, Guillaume. Um, would like to hear it one more time. There's some decoration in there, but uh, the simple thing is what's in the figure. Okay, this is John Dunstable, another piece that we heard early on, earlier on in the previous presentation. So 
So just a reminder, um, the phrase will still begin and end with an 8-5, an octave and a fifth, but no third. Um, and since it's hard to predict here which note is the bass note, I've put the circles around things. Um, note that this 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 clef is normal treble clef. These both are an octave below treble clef. So, but now most other sonorities um, are complete triads, and this guy's about a um, hundred years or so after Machaut. So Machaut had some triads. Um, Dunstable's kind of using them a lot of them. So there's an E minor in there. Um, that guy's the bass note. These guys, those are the bass notes. You can see circled, and then they produce an F major triad, a G major triad, an E major triad there. Um, so he's really got a lot of triads, not all, but lots. Um, the phrase and also has a very early 5-1 cadence. So you can see this E major chord going to this A, E, A chord. Um, so that's um, and, and this E is in the bass, so E, G sharp, B, going to A, E, A. So that's, um, you know, what we later call an authentic cadence, a five chord going to a one chord, and it's just a little weird because this one chord doesn't have a third in it, and that's what's going to be different later on. But at this early point, he's still ending with the 8-5 sonority. So if we take this thing, this little cadence, put it up here, Um, because the clefs are a little bit confusing. I've written it here on the grand staff. And I believe we get a little listen. Yeah. Uh, maybe not. Let's, let's, we can listen to, I believe, just the end in cadence. Yeah, it's the whole thing. So if we look at these last notes, so we have two, one, five, five, and <laughs> ti, do. Uh, so uh, putting that on the grand staff, you it, it looks like this. The bass goes uh, e a b a. G sharp, hey, and sorry, the E goes E E. <laughs> Apologize for my singing, but um, if we were to stack those, E B G sharp, A E A. Um, so though it's kind of a one chord at the end, it doesn't have a third in it. Um, this is that same cadence. We're just gonna look at it a little bit more closely because there's something pretty interesting about it. Um, let's check out the rules. So rule number two, this is a new one in the sense that I didn't introduce this in the previous screen, previous screens, parallel, perfect intervals. Um, this is going to be one of the main things that composers are really focused on all throughout the development of classical music polyphony. Um, avoid parallel, perfect intervals. That would be parallel, perfect fifths, parallel, perfect octaves, parallel, perfect unisons. Um, if we look at the voices that are here, this voice, this bottom voice is going mm, two, one, I think I'm still in the right key. And, and so this is going down. These two voices are going up. So if we're looking for parallels, we don't have to worry at all about the bass voice because this is going down. These guys are going up and these guys form a third. Hmm. And actually, that's a tenth because this is an octave below. E up to G sharp, a tenth, and then E up to A is a fourth. So it's definitely not parallel. They would have to be the same exact interval. So we have no problem with parallels. But look what happens when you reduce it because this E is below this B. So it ends up being E, B, G sharp, A, E, A. Um, <laughs> that's parallel fifths. So it's not parallel fifths the way he has voiced it. Um, he's kind of made it so there aren't parallel fifths, but he does kind of break a different rule, which is he's allowing this middle voice to go below this voice here, right? This E 
is below that B. And then this E, so if this is the base of this chord, it jumps up and it's going above where this one was. So that's called um, voice crossing, basically because this middle voice is below what the bass voice is. Um, but that does help him solve the problem. You don't have parallel fifths anymore. You have this outer voice motion, seven, one, two, one. And this guy is doing the voice crossing. So um, let's check. Does he resolve his tendency tones? He has scale degree seven, the leading tone that resolves up by steps. So that's good. Good job, John Dunstable. Um, two, one, you know, two doesn't have to go to one. It could go to three, but we could think of it as certainly wanting to go there. Um, but in any event, he has tendency tones. Yes, he's resolving them. Is he doubling? Is he doubling any tendency tones? He shouldn't do that, and he's not. And like I'm, I know maybe I said this too much, but I really don't mean that John Dunstable should or should not do this. What I mean is like he, like those other composers I was talking about, he, he probably didn't learn all that much from Machot and how to do this. Like he also is discovering these rules and discovering these practices. Um, so we get composers of multiple generations that um, sometimes they're, making arbitrary rules for themselves and then you know other people ignore those rules but sometimes they just keep composers keep rediscovering the same rules so that's what we're basically learning about this rediscovery of rules which may suggest that these are actually good rules to have okay a guideline that Leitz is going to point out for us um that we already talked about retain common tones moving upper voices mostly by step or by common tone so we see that the top voice is moving by step the bottom voice is moving downward by step but the middle voice what <laughs> it's jumping a huge amount so he doesn't follow that guideline but we're going to see other composers that don't follow that guideline it's a guideline it's not a rule Guideline number eight we saw before, also the outer voice contrary motion. Move the outer voices in contrary motion as much as possible. Is John Dunstable doing that? Well, that's interesting which one of these we're talking about. If we are talking about this voice leading the way he has it, the top voice goes up, the bottom voice goes down, then yes, he's following that rule. If we're talking about this one, the if the e and the a is the lowest voice if e goes up to a that's going up g sharp going up to a that's going up so those are not in contrary motion um i would say yeah i mean it's hard to answer this question because you, when you're doing voice leading exercises you're not going to allow voice crossing like this you're not going to allow the middle voice to be below the lowest voice at any point um but like we said John Dunstable does that to avoid the parallel fifths that he would get otherwise. Um, yeah, so it's hard to really say whether the outer voice is moving in contrary motion or not. I guess we're saying not. Okay, Guillaume Dufay, another example that we looked at in the Evolution of the Triad presentation. Let's, this is the end of this piece. Uh, let's give it a listen. So we're going to pay attention to just the cadence again, as we have been doing. We have a D, an A, an octave below, right? Based on the clap, so that A is right there. We have a D, again, an octave below, so that D is, eh, it would be right there, or it would be right there on a normal treble clef staff. And then we have an F sharp. There's a little suspension there, but ignore the fact that the G is hanging on and eventually resolves to an F sharp. Okay, so that's a D major chord. D, A, D and F sharp, and at the top we have a seven one, two one, or two one seven one, um, five five and five one, 
And then what's just interesting about this is it's gone five, five, three, four, five. Because at this time, it's still common to do an eight, five sonority on the end, right? But then if this is a real note, then you actually have a, a complete triad here. So we saw this as being an interesting early case of a cadence onto a complete triad, which doesn't happen usually. Could that be a G minor in, for, in root position? Um, a little thought bubble from Dufai. Should I end with a triad? Wait, what is a triad? So um, we have two versions of his cadence. So the first one, let's just do the first one. First one is with the bass going five, one, two, one, five, five, seven, one, five, five, two, one, five, three. So ignore that D up there. That should be this, just this B flat. And then seven, one. So it's hard to say which one we should pay attention to, but let's just try them both, see what we find. Um, so at the end, you would have a real five chord going to a complete one chord instead of five going to just an eight five sonority. And this would be a very early version of an authentic cadence. Authentic cadence is a five chord going to a one chord. What makes it a perfect authentic cadence? That would mean you have scale degree that you're approaching the tonic by step, so seven one or two one. Um, and the chords are in root position, and these chords are in root position. So that would be actually a perfect authentic cadence. Um, let's check out some of these rules. Rule number one, tendency tones, resolution, resolve, all oh, tendency tones. Which are the tendency tones? Um, and let's just, we can pay attention to either this one or this one. It doesn't matter. Um, I guess, um, let's just pay attention to this one for now. So you have... Mm, Seven, one, that's the leading tone going up to scale degree one. So has he resolved it? Yes. Um, yeah, in both cases. Parallel, or rule number two, parallel perfect intervals. He shouldn't be, or, you know, according to our later rules, he shouldn't be, um, he shouldn't have any parallel perfect fifths or octaves or unisons. It would be interesting if he did have them, like we saw in the Periton piece that he had them all over the place. In the previous presentation, we saw that, and I think that's kind of cool. Um, but at this point in time, composers are really avoiding parallel fifths and unisons and octaves, and we still do that today in classical music. So let's check what he's doing here. Um, here's how you do it. It's not easy. You have to look, take all pairs of voices. So if you have four voices, you have to go from bass to tenor, then bass to that one, alto, and then bass to soprano. And then you go from tenor to alto and tenor to soprano, and then you go from alto to soprano. So you got to check all those pairs. So um, let's do this. We have to look for parallels, um, but that's going to be easy in one sense because now the first thing we need to do is just look for voices going in the same direction. So from bass going to tenor, those are in contrary motion. From bass to alto. This one's not even moving at all, so we don't have to worry. It's called oblique motion. But here, bass is moving up and soprano is moving up. But that inter they're moving a different interval. This is moving up a fourth. This is moving up a tone. We could say the D up to F sharp is a, um, a, a tenth, and the G up to the G is an octave. So, yes, there's no parallels there that we have to worry about. Um, well now we just got to check the other sets. So alto or tenor up to alto, that's fine. This is oblique. Tenor up to soprano, they're going in contrary motion. Alto up to soprano, uh, this is, it's oblique. So there's no parallels there to worry about. And then um, the only thing that's different here is this voice is going down. So let's just check the other voice that's going down. Tenor and alto. Um, this interval here from D up or from A up to D is a fourth. And even if we had parallel fourths, it would be fine. But we don't even have parallel fourths. Uh, we have a fourth going to a D up to B flat would be a third, or D, G up to D, sorry, would be a fifth. So, yep, no parallels to worry about. Good job, Guillaume Dufay, for figuring this out before there were even rules. Um, tendency tones, doubling. We said that the F sharp is the only tendency tone, um, and it shouldn't be doubled. Did he double it? Nope. Let's just see what notes he did double in this chord. D, A, D, F sharp. So he's doubled the D. Cool. And what did he double in this chord? G, G, D, G. So he tripled the G 
and he's got a D in there. And notice that this chord is not complete. Let's check it out. In this chord, the same thing as before. He doubled the D. This one, if we're including the B flat and not the D, we get G, G, B flat, G. So tripled, root, and a third, and there's no fifth. Guideline number one. Let's check this one. Um, retain common tones. Moving upper voices mostly by step. Um, yeah, cool. Look, that there is a common tone retained. This is movement by step, movement by step. This is movement by leap, but it's the bass, so that's what's what's common to do. So this is like Dufay is doing the beginning of what we eventually will see as being very common. Movement by leap in the bass, and then everything else moves by step or stays the same. And the same would be here. It's just here the voice, this voice is going down by a small leap of a third, and that's fine too. Um, so there, fifth. And then finally, I think finally, guideline eight, outer voice contrary motion. Um, yeah, you don't always have to do this, but you often want to. So, But here the lowest voice is going up, D to G, and the top voice is going up, F sharp to G. So he's not going in contrary motion. Doesn't mean you always have to. It's just kind of a guideline. Like if you're like, well, which way should I move one of my two voices right now? You just try to move them in opposite one another and gives you something something to start with. Okay, Palestrina. I know this looks complex, but if you watched carefully the evolution of the triad video, you'll remember this screen. Um, we're going to focus just on the cadence. Give a listen, though. So I've brought out here just the cadence itself on the left, and I think this is audio of just the cadence. And that is reduced, oh yeah, so in the middle here it's reduced and then it's reduced even further. We have, I had to ignore this D, but this gives us G. B flat, an octave down, so the B flat is there. Another B flat, an octave down, that's the same B flat. And then an E. I was ignoring the F, which is sort of held over from the previous chord. Okay, so this gives us G, B flat, E, which is an E diminished chord in first inversion. And it goes to an F major chord in root position. F, C, A, C, F. So... FAC with F in the bass. Um, then over here, this is just exactly these notes, but copied out a little bit more. Oops, simply. Oops, sorry. Um, ignore there. This the bass is going two one. The soprano goes seven one. Alto or uh, sorry, tenor two goes four five, and tenor one goes. Four, three. Let me just play this one more time. So the soprano goes Tito, and you have Re, Do in the bass, and you have Fa, Sol, and then Fa, Mi. So Re, Do, Fa, Sol, Fa, Mi, Tito. And, and the alto just brings in a soul um, in this last chord. This gives us the E diminished, and this gives us an F major chord. So Pellestrino is reminding us, you know I'm going to be ending with the triad. He came at the end of the video, the evolution of the triad, and he isn't just using triads like here and there and on the penultimate chord, but he's using them now for the first time. Uh at least first time in our overview, um, on the final chord of a phrase. And then, since this is all still a bunch of staves, these are tr octave transposed, I put this in the grand staff notation. G, B flat, B flat, that's the same B flat there. And then E. And then we can see the E goes up to F. This B flat goes up to C. This B flat goes down to A. And then this G goes down to F. Um, now, 
is this a 5-1 cadence? No, it's not. This chord, this E diminished, is just a 7 chord in first inversion. But this is still like a classic contrapuntal cadence. You've got 2-1 in the lower voice, and you've got 7-1 in the upper voice. Um, so what I did is found us a cadence later on the piece that is more of a classic 5-7-1 cadence. Um, I have some more boxes to put on the screen. So sometimes called a contrapuntal cadence that's it's considered a little bit weaker than if you had five chord going to one. So this is going to give us a classic five, seven, one cadence. Let's give a listen. <laughs> So we're going to focus on that chord there and this chord here. Now, I know you're looking at me strangely, or you're trying. You're looking through the computer, trying to see if you can see me, so that you can look at me strangely, so you can say, hey, wait, that's the bass clef. This is the bass voice. There's an E in the bass. Why am I saying that this is in root position, a major C major minor seventh chord in root position? Well, remember, these guys transpose down by an octave, right? So this C really sounds right there. Mm. So this is actually the bass note. This C is lower than this E. Okay. And let's check it. Um, yeah, so I circled it. That's the bass note, and that's the bass note. Um, so we still have... I'm going to play it again so I get the right key so I can sing it. <laughs> So bass is going T do. This voice is going sol sol. This voice is going re do or two one. And then you, the bass is going seven one. So mostly before in compositions we were seeing that seven one was usually in the top voice, but not in this particular case. It's bass seven one two one. The soprano is going two three. Instead of seven ones going two, three. So this would not be a perfect authentic cadence. It would be imperfect authentic, because it's ending on scale degree three. And then you and then you have mm, four, three. This four is gonna be the seventh of the five seven chord that we'll see is C, E, G, B flat. So that's the seventh of the chord. Four, three, four, soul fa. Sol, ti, re, fa, mi. Okay, so scale degree four, or fa, is the seventh of the chord that's going to resolve down. And then the, in the this voice, which is tenor two, this is the bass voice, but you have that weird motion again where it's going, it's jumping up an octave. And so in Palestrina's time, it's still perfectly okay to voice cross, but this voice here is called voice crossing because it is below tenor two is below the bass here whereas tenor two is above the bass and above uh tenor one and it's even above the alto voice on this beat so that's called voice crossing so let's look at this um just simplified on this set of staves um and then we have this that gets simplified. I put this on the grand staff. So you can now really see that this C, that's an octave below here, is there, right? You can see it comes there. So this is what the, the sonority looks like um, if we put all of this in the proper octaves on the grand staff. Um, and this is weird. It looks like a, a voice just appears here, but that C is coming from that C. But, and, and this B flat is going down to A, this G is going down to F, this G is going up to A, this E is going up to F. So looking at it this way helps you see the voice leading. Looking at it this way helps you see what the chords are. Mm. I'm not sure what happened. Okay, so actually I'm gonna go back a little bit. Oops. I think I'm going back. Uh oh. Okay. 
I did want to play this for you one more time now that we have everything on the screen. So let's just check some of these rules. Um, let's look for our tenancy tones first. So, hmm. good job, Palestrina. Um, I just have to say that the rules of voice leading are pretty much based on Palestrina. So it's not really like Palestrina is following the rules. It's like we got our rules from Palestrina. Um, T do seven one down here and fa me or four three. So four seven seven four. Um, those are our tendency tones, both the four and the seven. And we'll have a screen later where we talk specifically what I mean by tendency tones. But for now, these are the two tendency tones. Seven is the leading tone that goes up to one, and four is the leading tone. Or sorry, four is the seventh that wants to go down to three. Okay, so these tendency tones are being resolved, and they're not being doubled. These are two different tones, obviously, but there's no other f f scale degree four in here. There's a five, a two, and a two. There's no other scale degree sevens. Um, which note is doubled, scale degree two is doubled, and notice that two here goes up and two here goes down. So whenever you do double note, it has to go in two different directions. Okay. Good job, number one. Good job, number one. Rule number two, parallel perfect intervals. Has Palestrina avoided any parallel perfect intervals? Well, let's check... Now there's five voices, so we have to do this a lot. So from bass, we check with tenor. I mean, both those guys are going up, but this is jumping up a lot. This is jumping up a little bit, so this is not parallel. Um, this guy's going the opposite direction. This guy's going the opposite direction. This one's going up. So let's just check bass against cantus um, or soprano. So E up to G is a tenth. And already we know it's going to be fine because they're moving to another tenth, but tenths, parallel tenths, perfectly okay. Um, okay, now we have to take tenor against everything else. Tenor is going up by an octave. No one else is going up by an octave, so we're fine. Tenor one is going down by a second. Alto is going down by a second, but that is a third from G up to B flat, F up to A, third. So parallel thirds, perfectly okay. Um, tenor, we don't have to worry about uh, alto. Nope, there's no other parallels to check, so we're fine. So yes, good job. Very sorry about that. Rule number four, spacing. No more than an octave between adjacent open voices. Why did I put that in quotes? Is that because someone famous said it? Yeah, his name is Professor Bashwinner. He's super famous, and everything he says you have to obey. So he really only says one thing, and that one thing is no more than an octave between adjacent open voices. So you just kind of want to remember that. That's a spacing rule. Um, it will come up more later. Um, but now is the first time you learn it officially. So, you know, if Palestrina's not doing it, it's not the biggest deal because we're checking, we're like, um, you know, these are when the rules of voice leading are being formed. But once we get to our own exercises, we have to obey this rule. So let's just take a look at it. What it's going to mean is, so no more than an octave, which means you can have up to an octave, but not more, between adjacent upper voices. So you don't have to worry about the bass, just with all the voices that are above the bass. And then the only adjacent ones. So you're looking, is there more than a, an octave between this C and this G? No. Is there more than an octave between this G and this B flat? No. Is there more than an octave between this B flat and this G? This B flat is down here. So answer is no. So there is not more than an octave between adjacent upper voices in this chord. We check it in this chord. Um, we don't have to pay attention to the bass, but this C, um, yeah. The answer is no, there's not more than an octave between adjacent upper voices. We could look at the, the greatest distance here between the B flat and the G is a sixth, and the greatest distance here between the C and the A is also a sixth. So 
Yes, he has obeyed rule number four. Guideline one, which we saw earlier, common tones and steps. Retain common tones. Move upper voices mostly by moving upper voices mostly by step. If you have to move them at all, um, here there's no. We can look in here. There's no common tones. The C and the C. I mean, he's moved by an octave. So there, he's kind of breaking the rule. He's moving a lot, but all the other voices are moving by step, up by step, down by step, down by step, up by step. So that one breaks the rule, but it's just a guideline. Guideline two, melodic leaps. Avoid melodic leaps involving dissonant intervals. So that would be a diminished fifth or augmented fourth and in something else. And this is especially the case in inner voices. Um, you can sometimes leap a diminished fifth, especially if you're in the melody. Um, but really in inner voices, you want to have them be doing as simple, um, mostly stepwise stuff if possible. Um, so... He does a great job there, not leaping any dissonant intervals. Wow, there's more. Guideline number three, voice crossing and voice overlap. Typically, you want to avoid voice crossing. I have a picture of this on a later screen, but that means that the voices um, here, tenor two, is above tenor one at this particular moment in time. So that's simultaneous. And then voice overlap, this is also voice overlap, but but voice crossing is the biggest one. So if you have, we have a screen later, but if, because he's going up on this note, the tenor two is going above where tenor one was before it, that's also called voice overlap. But um, maybe ignore voice overlap for now, but he is not obeying that rule. That's a later rule. And even Bach does no ve obey this rule all the time. But composers generally try to not cross voices and not overlap voice areas. Guideline number five, completeness. Try to write complete chords, but if necessary, omit the fifth. Um, let's just check if these chords are complete. We can look in the simple way here. C, E, G, B flat. Yeah, it's got all the notes. That's yeah, got an extra G, so he doubled the G. Um, and then does this have all the notes of the F, A, C chord? F, A, C. Yeah, that, the, both of those are complete chords. Good job, Palestrina. Guideline number six. Doublings in general prefer to double the root. Next, the fifth. And if it's not good to double either the root or the fifth, then you double the third. Um, in this chord, we saw that the G is doubled, so that's the fifth of the chord. Um, in this one, we see that the A is doubled, so he doubled the third. So he doesn't seem to be preferring, the, you know, paying any special attention to doubling the root. He's happy to double the fifth in this chord or double the third in this chord. But he does a good job. Guideline number eight, out of voices, contrary motion. Here we have the soprano is going up and the bass is going, oops, that C is in the bass. So... Um, hard to say again, but either way, the C is going up to F or the C is going up to C. So this one, he's not doing the contrary motion. He's they're, they're in similar motion, and that's also perfectly fine, though. It's just a guideline. Guideline number 10, this is the last one, um, simultaneous leaps. Uh, you ideally want to avoid leaping simultaneously in two voices at the same time. This voice is leaping, but everybody else is moving by step. Yeah, so we're good. Good job. Al Astrina. So let's look at some generalizations about the 5 7 chord. Um, it, oh, let me just show you one more thing, by the way. Uh, this, everything we looked at before, even if we've had a 5 to 1 cadence, we haven't actually seen that it was 5 7 to 1. So now we're getting that for the first time. And just like in looking at this historical survey, um, we get C, E, G, B flat. Um, the B flat is the seventh of the chord. Sevenths are going to go down. B flat is going to go down to A, which is the third of the F chord. And then we still have that leading tone, the E, going to F. So this is a 5-7 to 1 cadence, and it's still considered authentic because it's a 5 going to a 1. And we said that since the soprano is going 2 to 3, it's not going 2-1 or 7-1. Therefore, it's not perfect authentic. This is an imperfect authentic cadence. So, 
Some generalizations about resolving 5-7. The leading tone, scale degree 7, resolves upward to the tonic, scale degree 1. It has to do this if it's in an outer voice, um, which would, when you reduce it on the grand staff, like on, on the far right of the previous screen. Um, if scale degree 7 is in an inner voice, it doesn't have to resolve to 1, but it still wants to. The seventh of the 5 7 chord, which is scale degree 4, is going to resolve down to the third of the 1 chord, which is scale degree 3. The seventh of the chord has to do this. It has to resolve down, irrespective of which voice it's in. These same notes, scale degree 4 and scale degree 7, are also in the 7 6 chord, as we've seen. Um, Typically, you do want to resolve them in the same way as in the 5-7 chord. That means scale degree 4 would resolve down to scale degree 3, and scale degree 7 would resolve up to scale degree 1. But 4 can resolve up to scale degree 5 in the 7 chord if that improves voice leading. And we actually saw that in the Periton cadence, the Machot cadence, maybe even some of the Dufay or Dunstable cadences, scale degree 4 was often going up to scale degree 5. You can't do that in the 5-7 chord. Scale degree 4 in the 5-7 chord is the 7th of the 5-7 chord. It has to go down. But if you're in the 7 chord, scale degree 4 could go up. If you double a note, um, If you double a note, the two have to voice lead in opposite directions on the following chord to avoid parallel octaves. So that's the case for, for any note that you double. Um, I mentioned that earlier. At some point, we had scale degree two that was doubled. And so in one voice, scale degree two is going to go up. And in the other voice, scale degree two is going to go down. And uh, let me just go back for a second and say that the reason you don't double tendency tones like you don't double the leading tone is because the leading tone has to go up. So if you doubled the leading tone, one leading if both leading tones went up, that would give you parallel octaves or parallel unisons. That's why you don't double the leading tone. And the same with the seventh of the chord. The seventh has to go down. So you don't double it because both sevenths would have to go down. That would give you parallel octaves. The tones four and seven, scale degree four and scale degree seven, form a tritone. It's a diminished fifth, or it's an augmented fourth, depending on which is which of these notes is on top. So let me, I'll show you that. Augmented fourths, if you have scale degree four on the bottom, scale degree seven on top, let's say we're in, let's, we could do F major, because that's the, the key that we were just in with Palestrina. Scale degree four would be B flat. Scale degree seven would be E. If the E is in the upper voice, and B flat is in a lower voice, then from four up to seven is a fourth, Scale degree four, five, six, seven. That's a fourth. And what kind of fourth is it? It's augmented from B flat up to E. Um, uh, yeah, so that's a tritone. And then, actually, in a second, we'll just go ahead and do that now. We'll see that if you put scale degree four on top and scale degree seven on the bottom, um, it's the same notes, right? This is still an E. This is still a B flat. But... This is a diminished fifth. The seven scale degree seven up to scale degree four is a fifth. So that one's diminished fifth. That one's augmented fourth. They both are called tritones. The augmented fourth wants to resolve out, and that's simply because scale degree seven wants to go up to one. Scale degree four wants to go down to three. And the diminished fifth wants to go in, and that's just because four wants to go down to three and seven wants to go up to one. Okay. So you can remember these rules. Augmented fourths typically resolve outward. Diminished fifths typically resolve inward. So tendency tones, certain chords have notes that are considered tendency tones. What do we mean by this? The tendency can be thought of it as a tendency to resolve in a particular direction. Usually this resolution would be stepwise, whether up or down. Most often the ten tendency tone is a semitone away from its resolution. That's not always the case, but the leading tone is always a semitone below the tonic. And then the seventh, if you're in a major key, the seventh of the 5-7 chord is a semitone above scale degree three, right? Scale degree four is a semitone above scale degree three. So both of those move resolve by semitone. And then most often tendency tone, a tendency tone forms a dissonance with another note in the chord that it's in. So um, scale degree, if in the five seven chord, um, 
scale degree four is the seventh of the chord, and that forms a tritone with scale degree seven, which is the third of the chord. I know that's difficult, uh, but I have this exact thing on a, on a screen in pictures somewhere. Um, so it'll make more sense in a second. But scale degree four, that's the seventh of the five seven chord, is also a seventh with scale degree five, which is obviously also in the five chord. So um, there's dissonances in the chord itself, and that's what makes those tones tendency tones. So not all chord tones are tendency tones. In the one chord, there are no tendency tones. Scale degrees one, three, and five, they can move in any direction in whatever, um, any of those tones could go in any direction, whichever chord you go to next. But the five, seven chord, assuming it's going to a one, two of the notes are tendency tones, and two of them are non-tendency tones. So scale degrees two and five are non-tendency tones. They could resolve in whichever way they want to. Scale degree two could go up to three, it could go down to one. Scale degree five could stay on five, it could go down to three, and we'll see on the next screen that if it's in the bass, scale degree five could go up to one or down to one. So those guys have lots of options open. Two can go up to three or down to one. Five can stay on five or it can go down to three. Or if it's in the bass, it can ascend or descend to one. Scale degrees four and seven, though, those guys are tendency tones. They have specific directions in which they need to resolve. And we saw this on the previous screen. Scale degree seven wants to go up. That's what that little carrot on the top means that's scale degree seven. Um, uh, oh. And then the seventh of the chord, which is scale degree four, um, wants to resolve down to scale degree three. And just a reminder that um, Reminder that scale degree seven. Um, oh yeah, the leading tone wants to go up. If it's in an outer voice, it has to go up. But if it's in an inner voice, it doesn't have to. Uh, whereas the seventh of the chord, it doesn't matter what voice it's in, it always has to go down. So we'd just like you to recall that scale degrees four and seven form a dissonance with one another an augmented fourth or diminished fifth, which is what makes them tendency tones. The augmented fourth resolves out, the diminished fifth resolves in, as we see at the top of the screen. And that since scale degree four is the seventh of the chord, it's also dissonant with the bass, which is scale degree five. This is what I said at the top of the screen. Okay, let's say this is our five seven chord. Um, there's an augmented fourth there between scale degree four and seven. And there is a seventh there between scale degree. F Oops. Um, I fixed it. So four up to seven is an augmented fourth. From five up to four is a minor seventh. Then um, this just shows you the voice leading pattern. So scale degree seven um, very badly wants to go up to scale degree one. Um, this is, and we can think of this as a typical soprano voice. You'll often have it in another voice. We saw it in the palestrina. It was in the bass voice at some point. Um, but I think it helps to think of this as being like the typical soprano voice. Typically of scale degree seven in the soprano goes up to scale degree one. Um, and that's what we saw in like just about all the cadences that we we looked at in the evolution of the triad video and and all the ones that i recapped here okay sometimes and this is pretty much like in classical music and maybe broke scale degree seven if it's in an inner voice it could go down to scale degree five but just you're allowed to do it but sort of ignore it for now that's only if it's in an inner voice focus on resolving your leading tone upward no matter what voice it's in as we saw in all in the evolution of cadences and triads, scale degree two is often going down to scale degree one. 
Um, so scale degree 7 goes up to 1, scale degree 2 goes down to 1. That's the classic contrapuntal cadence. That's what we use in species counterpoint all over the place in two voices. Um, we saw it on all the cadences of the history of the triad video. Um, let's call this the typical tenor voice because the tenor is like the canis firmus, right? It's the, the, the held chant. So that's where the term tenor comes from because tenor means to hold. Um, and in our, can, our species exercises, canis firmus is always going 2, 1, and the counterpoint is going 7, 1. Okay. So, but I would like to point out that it's also very common to have 2, 1 in the soprano. And whenever you have a perfect authentic cadence, the soprano is going to go either 7, 1 or 2, 1. So you can have it in other voices. And then we saw in that one Palestrina cadence that scale degree 2 could go up to scale degree 3. So that's okay. Now, the only thing is that if you do have a 5, 7 chord here, 4 is going down to 3, then you're going to end up with a doubled third if you go to 3. But it's, it's not a problem to have a double third. It's just not as common. So in our 5, 7 chord, scale degree 4 is the 7th. It has to resolve down. We're going to call this a typical alto voice. But it really could be in any voice. And it's going to be a very common soprano line in an imperfect authentic cadence. What makes this imperfect instead of perfect? Perfect, the soprano has to end up on scale degree 1. right? So one of those guys, imperfect. Soprano ends up on scale degree 3. Well, I guess that could be imperfect also. And then for scale degree 5, well, I might as well just complete this thing. Um, for scale degree 5, if it's in the bass, the most common thing is to have the two root position chords, 5 chord going to 1 chord. So, um, sol, do, or sol, do. Sol, do, or sol, do. And then... So me is very common for imperfect authentic cadence or so so it's not super common believe it or not it would be common for an inner voice but for the soprano you, that would only be a very weak cadence where you end on scale degree five in the melody okay scale degree seven versus chordal seventh this is just to clarify these two terms i know these words are really big <laughs> apologize for that so leading tone scale degree seven um, and it's the third of the chord of the 5-7 chord, right? Or it's the chordal third. The chordal seventh, so right, we're talking about two different kinds of sevens. The leading tone is scale degree seven. The, the seventh of the chord is, the, is a completely different note. Um, the seventh of the chord, or the chordal seventh, is scale degree four. So um, scale degree seven... If we're in the key of, let's go back to the key of F, Palestrina key. If we're in the key of F, scale degree 7 is E. E wants to go up to F. If, and still in the key of F, the 7th of the 5-7 chord is B flat that wants to go down to A. So this is E, this is B flat. I'm going to do put us in C major for a second. If we're in C major, scale degree 7 is B. It's um, the, the scale degree 7 of C major, yeah, is B. In... The 5 7 chord in C major is G, B, D, F. So it's the third of that chord. B is the third of G, B, D, F. Um, you can call it the chordal third. Whereas this guy, the seventh of the G, B, D, F chord is F, the note F. This one was B. This is F. Um, F is the seventh of the G, B, D, F chord. And F is scale degree four. C, D, E, F. Okay. So try not to confuse seventh of the chord and scale degree seven. One of them wants to go up, one of them wants to go down. And now, to summarize the rules of voice leading, you're gonna move the, this are sort of like general principles. Move the voices as little as possible when changing chords. Maintain the independence and musical territory of each voice, otherwise they get mad. Construct chords logically. And um, <laughs> here are some tips for avoiding problems. So. This first one, move the voices as little as possible when changing chords. Rule number one, these come directly from late's tendency tones resolution. Resolve your tendency tones. When we saw that earlier, all over the place. Scale degree seven wants to go up, seventh wants to go down. In the case of the five seventh chord, these are scale degrees four and seven, the seventh and third of the chord. Guideline one, common tones and steps. Retain common tones, moving upper voices mostly by step. Guideline two, melodic leaps. Avoid melodic leaps involving dissonant intervals including in inner voices. Diminished fifth is usually okay, but avoid the augmented fourth and definitely avoid the augmented second, which you will often get when you're in melodic 
minor. Second general category, maintain the independence and musical territory for each voice. Rule two, parallels. Avoid parallel perfect intervals. Parallel fifths, octaves, unisons. Fourths, of course, are okay. Parallel fourths are okay, but they're just considered dissonances. This is just a reminder of what um, parallel motion looks like. So contrary motion, voices going in opposite directions. Oblique motion, one voice is staying the same. Parallel, they're both going, here they're both going up, and it's specifically a third in both cases, whereas they're similar motion if they're both going up, but this is a third to a fourth, or just different intervals. Tendency tones, doubling. Um, tendency tones should not be doubled. This would be leading tones and sevenths of chords. Why can you not double your tendency tones? It's because they the seventh always has to go down, the leading tone always has to go up. So if you're doubling the leading tone, you're going to get both voices going up in parallel octaves. Similarly, if you double the seventh of a chord, both those notes want to go down by step, so you're going to get parallel octaves. Okay, rule number four, spacing. Remember, this is what you're going to remember verbatim because it was quoted, it's a quote from a very famous um, music theorist at the University of New Mexico named Dr. David Bashwinner. No more than an octave, he says, between adjacent upper voices. That's between upper voices. You don't have to pay attention to the bass. Um, no more than an octave means you can have an octave. The soprano and the alto, for instance, could be an octave apart, but just not more than that. And it's only between adjacent upper voices. So um, it doesn't matter how much space is between the soprano and the tenor. It's only between tenor and alto or between alto and soprano. Guideline number three, voice crossing and voice overlap. Avoid voice crossing and voice overlap. Crossing is simultaneous. Overlap is successive. Let's look at a picture. Here's voice crossing. The orange lines, we call them alto, and the blue lines are, their blue dots are tenors. The tenor notes, so the tenor here goes, is above the alto at one point in time. That's why I call it simultaneously. In this case, it's trickier, so I put in some lines here in a musical staff. So um, here, the, the alto is always above the tenor, but the tenor is going above where the alto was on the previous note. So the idea there is you still lose track of you lose one of the voices is the idea. So this is successive and it's only the exact next note. Doesn't, you know, um, here the blue is going above where the orange was in the previous place. So voice overlap is a little bit trickier to see, but you want to avoid both of those things. Guideline number four, I don't think is super important. I will kind of show you around it. Um, but for now, don't worry too much about it. I put it in grayish, blueish gray. Um, it's the notion of director hidden fifths or director hidden octaves. So Lates has you avoiding direct or hidden fifths and octaves between outer voices unless the soprano moves by step. So what is a direct fifth or hidden fifth? First of all, direct and hidden mean the same thing. So I just, um, you can call it either one. So what are direct fifths? Direct fifths uh, are when you move in similar motion to a fifth. Uh, and it only matters for fifths and octaves, so those perfect intervals. Um, and then the thing about it, unless the soprano moves my step, somehow it just doesn't sound as bad. Um, so hidden and the direct mean the same thing. Similar motion into a perfect consonance. Uh, at some point, I will try to illustrate this for you. The The basic idea is that if you're... Yeah. Um, I don't have a good example right now. Just for now, kind of don't pay attention to guideline four, but just keep it in the back of your mind. Maybe I'll explain it at some point. Construct chords. Logically, guideline five, completeness. Try to write complete chords. But eh, if you got to omit... A note, omit the fifth. Never omit the root or the third. And if there's supposed to be a seventh, for if you're, for instance, if you're writing figure bass and the figure says seven, five, three, or just like seven, right, which means seven, five, three, then you can't omit the seventh. That means you'd have to put it in there. Okay. Guideline number six, doublings. In general, you want to double the root 
uh, if you can't double the root, then you double the fifth. Uh, if you can't double the root or the fifth, then you double the third. And that's what we saw with Palestrina in that one case. Um, the one place where we looked at doubling in that one chord, he doubled the fifth, and in another chord, he doubled the third. And there's nothing wrong with either of those things. But in general, try to double the root. So there's a couple exceptions. So for an inversion, you often want to double the base of the chord, not the root. In an inversion, by definition, the root is not going to be in the base. The base is going to be some note other than the root of the chord. If you need to remember the difference between root and base, I think you should probably review the, I think it's the evolution of the triad video. Um, so for inversions, typically you want to double the base, but if the base note is a tendency tone, you don't want to double the bass because you never want to double a tendency tone. Remember that? So if the leading tone is in the bass, don't double the bass. If the seventh of the chord is in the bass, don't double the bass. So that means don't double the bass of a 5-6 chord because a 5 chord in first inversion has the leading tone in the bass. Same with a 5-6-5 five, five chord. That's a 5-7 in first inversion. The leading tone is in the bass. In a 5-4-2 chord, 5-7 chord in third inversion, the seventh of the chord is in the bass, so don't double that. And similarly, the 7-6 chord, we'll get a little bit more practice with all this stuff later, but the 7-6 chord, oh sorry, not 7-6, seven, 7 in root position, that's a typo. Um, there, If it's a 7 chord in root position, don't double the bass because the leading tone is in the bass. For seventh chords, um, Five six five five four three five four two. Uh, oh, sorry. Seventh chords in inversion. You know what? I'm just going to fix these things. Um, so I did fix this now. So it just says seven in root position. You don't want to double the bass in that chord. For inverted seventh chords, such as five six five five four three or five four two, in the then this chord, this the third of the. 5-7 chord is in the bass, the 5th of the 5-7 chord is in the bass, or the 7th is in the bass. Try to have a complete chord with no doublings. So this is something you learn, I think, in chapter 8. You know, you get, paid, you get to pay more attention to it. But in general, um, you know, we're always talking about doublings. That's because we're always usually having four voices, and there's only three notes in a chord. If it's a 7th chord, you have four notes in the chord, but you still often omit the 5th. But... If the chord is inverted, it's best to just try to have all four voices on different notes of the chord. You want to try to have complete chord if your chord is, if it's an inverted seventh chord. Yeah, just try to remember that for now or keep it in the back of your mind. And then lastly, Lates gives you some tips for avoiding problems. He suggests in guideline seven that you write the outer voices first. This is when you're doing exercises. So what I'm... Um, saying here to elaborate is that you can think of the outer voices, the bass and soprano, as being an exercise in species counterpoint, like you've done first species, second species, third species, etc. Making sure, and actually just mostly first species, but making sure that both the bass and the soprano are melodic and that they form a good composition in two voice counterpoint. And then secondarily, you can fill in the inner voices in a way such a way that the voice leading in those inner parts is elegant and supportive of the outer voice relationships. But in general, like the tenor and the alto lines, you might be thinking they're going to get bored if they do too simple of things, and that's, that's not true. Um, you're doing exercises, and the tenor and alto are not real people. Even if, even if they were real people, they're perfectly happy to just sing the same note over and over again. So you give them pretty simple stuff, not moving around too much. They're, the inner voices are supposed to support the outer voices. Okay, guideline eight, outer voice contrary motion. This is just a, a guideline. We saw that like not that many composers that we were looking at actually do this, but sometimes they do. So if you've got a bass line that's given to you and you're supposed to write a melody in line with it, a good first start is to just every time the bass is going up, take the soprano down. And if it doesn't work in certain cases, then you change that. But you can use this as a general principle to start out. Move outer voices in contrary motion as much as possible. Guideline nine, I put in bluish gray. Um, it late suggests that you start in close position when you're writing exercises um, with a complete chord. I mean, it's good to start with a complete chord. I, I don't think you necessarily have to start in close position. But then you try to maintain close position as much as possible. Uh, 
And then I wrote, this rule is less important in my opinion, but it does apply well for keyboard style compared to Corel style. We will watch a video, maybe this week, maybe it's a, a later week, about voice leading in keyboard style versus um, Corel style. But Corel style is where you have S-A-T-B um, on separate staves, whereas keyboard style is where you have the upper voices on, sorry, uh, uh, Corel style is where you have tenor and bass on the lower staff and soprano and alto on the upper staff, whereas keyboard style, um, you have soprano, alto, tenor on the top staff and the bass on the bottom staff. And the rules are just slightly different, which is with keyboard style, you want to basically stay within an octave in the right hand in the upper three voices. Okay, and I believe this is the last one, guideline number 10, simultaneous leaps. Oh, it's not the last one, I don't think. Guideline number 10, simultaneous leaps. Avoid leaps in multiple voices simultaneously. And that's something that we were doing in Species Counterpoint as well. And then, yeah, that is the last one. Okay, so I have a conclusion and then an outro screen. In conclusion, in classical music and related genres, so like Baroque, Renaissance, Romantic, all that stuff, when moving from chord to chord, one always considers how the individual voices are moving. And I would say that is something that distinguishes classical music from popular music, rock music, um, uh, jazz. Um, even Hollywood composition, I don't think that you pay as much attention to it. So it's standard to think in four voices in this voice leading in classical music, not three voices, not five voices. Like we do stuff in two voices, the counterpoint, and then we do four voices for voice leading. So soprano, alto, tenor, bass. There might be many different instruments playing a single voice. So if you take a Beethoven or a Mozart um, symphony, you could often reduce it to four voices. Um, but you might have a whole bunch of instruments. You might have all of the French horn. I don't know. You might have all of the, the horn section playing, um, you know, the bass line or the tenor line or something like that. You might have a bunch of different instruments or you might have the cellos and the bassoons and uh, maybe some other instrument all playing the tenor voice. Okay. There are going to be two essential rules that we should consider the most important. Avoid parallel octaves and fifths. This is the kind of thing that composers start doing in about 1300, and then that is, I'd say, one of the main motivator of the voice leading rules that we see developing across the whole millennium of multi-part writing. Then also resolve tendency tones appropriately. Your leading tones, you're going to want to resolve them up, and sevenths, you're going to resolve down. These are the two main rules of voice leading, and I think everything else kind of follows subsidiarily from that. So the two other rules, I think you could say follow from them, or at least they're consistent with them. So one of them is don't double your tendency tones. This one really does follow from the idea of resolving tendency tones, right? If you've doubled a tendency tone and you're going to resolve the tones correctly, then they're going to create parallel octaves and fifths. So this one follows, I guess, from both of these rules. Another one is, you know, I'd, yeah, not to allow more than an octave of space between adjacent upper voices. This one isn't as big a deal as these, but maybe these three are the biggest ones. And then this last one is, it, um, yeah, it's kind of important for getting a good sound. It, um, anyway, let's keep going. Then there are some guidelines to assure consistently, a consistently fluid sound. Um, so each voice should be melodic. This is That's a basic feature of counterpoint generally, and it's what we talked about at the very beginning, that in, in popular music, rock music, you think about chords and melody, um, whereas anything that is classical genre, typically you're paying attention to the voice leading, which means the individual voices should be melodic. They're not just playing chords. They are melodies in themselves. So each voice should be melodic, should move as little as possible, especially in the inner voices, right? The bass can jump around, the melody can have some dramatic leaps, but the middle voices certainly should move as little as possible. And they shouldn't be leaping awkward intervals. So don't leap an augmented fourth. Most of the time, don't leap a diminished fifth. Don't leap an augment, don't skip an augmented second. Those are awkward intervals. 
Um, the voices should maintain independence, so they shouldn't cross or overlap. We looked at that a little bit. You don't want to have them leaping simultaneously. That's something we practice in Species Counterpoint. And then mostly those voices, the, it's good for voices to move in contrary motion. That's especially those outer voices. If your bass is moving up, it's nice to have the soprano move down or vice versa. But that is really just a very general guideline. You're obviously not going to always have contrary motion. But you do want to maintain an independence between the voices unless you're looking for some specific effect. Otherwise, the definition of counterpoint basically is to maintain independence, melodic uniqueness and independence. And then um, we saw this only kind of gradually emerging as the style of Palestrina kind of develops out of the stuff that's coming before it. But by the time you get to Palestrina, just about all the chords Everything is a chord. Everything is a complete triad with a root, third, and fifth. And if you have sevenths, root, third, fifth, seventh. Um, so chords should be complete when possible. Um, if you omit, any, omit anything, you omit the fifth. And then when you're doubling stuff, right, you just, the doublings are not just so um, the chord is complete. But you also, I mean, you don't want to just avoid doubling tendency tones. You also want to make doubling that sounds nice. So you can mess around with different doublings than how they sound. So finally, um, is voice leading unique to classical music? This concern with how voices lead in a composition, I have only come to realize in the course of this presentation, is perhaps the most consistent aspect of compositional practice seen in our survey of classical and pre-classical styles from about 850, like when we first see people in Europe writing in two voices or more, and then up to 1900, and you know, it's kind of like free for all starting in 1900. But um, I think you can say, that's not saying it's unique to classical music, but that is saying it is actually, I think, fundamental to it. To pay attention to voice leading. So I some might I personally sometimes think about the voice leading rules as being like, why do people have to follow these rules? But the flip side of that is it's by paying attention to these rules and kind of thinking like, what do these rules do and when why are they here and why did composers adapt these rules in the first place? Then you really start to see stuff in classical music and pre-classical music that that you wouldn't see otherwise. Um, so, and it becomes, I think those are beautiful, valuable things to see. So it's still, there's this interesting thing that before the idea of the chord existed, right? Which Lippius, that term, the term triad, Lippius coins it in 1610. Um, and then... It's kind of right around that time that Monteverdi is using, using seventh chords too without preparing them in any way, without preparing the sevenths as suspensions. We learn about suspensions later. Um, but so before the idea of a chord exists, composers are, they are using, they're thinking about verticalities, but they are really thinking, like before they're thinking like, oh, here's a C major chord, here's a five chord, here's a one chord. Those terms don't even come about until the 18th century. So before composers have those ideas for structure and compositions, they're simply thinking about how to coordinate simultaneous voices to produce certain acceptable vertical intervals, unisons, octave fifths, the eight five sonorities, eventually triads and stuff like that. Um, once, comp once the idea of an chord does start to enter composers' minds, once the, once the chord becomes a thing, and I think you could say this would be the early Baroque when, um, when, when early opera is first created, and they're focused on writing a beautiful melody with a very, very, very simple accompaniment that's just written in figured bass. So once composers start doing that, and then eventually put the name triad on things, and eventually give the names dominant and subdominant and tonic, tonique. Um, once composers start thinking of chords as things, then it's possible for them to think in terms of a solo vocal line or solo instrumental line with chord-like accompaniment. And that's exactly the kind of thing you get at the very beginning of the Baroque. And then you get it again at the beginning of the classical era. And you could say you get it again in the 1960s with um, melody and accompaniment, with, with like folk revival, with blues, um, with even the American popular song, maybe. Um, so in other words, 
in these cases where you're thinking about chords and a melody line, and even in that Mozart piece where he's writing a melody line that just goes with the very simple chords that are arpeggiated. In, so in other words, when composers are thinking like this, thinking in chords, they no longer have to think about voice leading. So if you don't have the idea of a chord, you have to think about voice leading. If you have the idea of chords, you actually don't have to think about voice leading. By the time the classical era rolls around, composers like Mozart may have been mostly thinking about chords and melodies, much like we do today, e.g., um, for instance, looking up a guitar or uke chords on the internet for a song we like, and then just singing the melody while we strum the chords. Mozart and other classical composers, or romantic composers after that, um, were still obeying the laws of voice leading, right? They still studied that when they were kids. When Mozart taught lessons to composers, he didn't teach a melody and accompaniment. He taught them um, specious counterpoint, like what you learn. So even when he's writing in a texture that looks like that figuration that we saw early on in this video, um, that arpeggiation, he's actually still doing the voice leading thing, right? That top voice is all staying on G. The middle voice is just going back and forth between E and D. And it was the lower voice that's kind of bouncing around. So he is obeying the laws of voice leading, even if the texture that he's doing sort of obscures that. And a final question, do composers in non-European styles of music obey any kinds of voice leading rules? What do you think the answer is going to be? Well, I don't know. <laughs> so, but I am going to start um, seeing if I can figure this out. And if you have any ideas, please let me know.